Our God is still on his throne and ruling the affairs of man. Even as he does not change, his truths have not changed. Thankfully, God still has a people which proclaim that old-time religion, setting forth his sovereignty, and the old paths of truth where we can find rest for our souls. Welcome to Word of Sovereign Grace, a ministry of Paradise Primitive Baptist Church in Arlington, Texas. Get your Bible, call your friends, and sit back as we open the King James Scriptures to explore the glorious word of sovereign grace. Here's this week's message. It's good to be here this afternoon and to be um, with all of you, but mostly it's good to be here because uh, being here is an opportunity to worship the Lord. And there's just not anything better than that. It just doesn't get any better. Thankful for uh, Brother Evans and the message that um, he's brought to us um, this afternoon. I leaned over to my wife while he was preaching and, and told her when I was a little boy um, that that's what preachers sounded like. Um, his uh, style of preaching and method of delivery um, is what um, I used to hear when I went to associations. When I came to association right here um, in Bonham, Texas, um, when I was seven or eight years old, and Elder H.D. Ball was here, and um, Elder um, Webb, and different ones like that, um, that's how they preach. Um, Elder Dalton, uh, different ones, that's how they preach. And, uh, so it's encouraging uh, to me to hear um, the gospel preached today uh, the same way that it was preached when I was just a, a little boy and um, would typically get my ear thumped two or three times during a <laughs> preaching service. <clears throat> Brother um, Evans mentioned a, a text that I'd like to use this um, afternoon by way of introducing our subject. He, he mentioned the text um, where the Apostle um, tells us that they who would worship the Lord uh, must worship Him in spirit and in truth. And, of course, if you are um, worshiping in spirit and truth, um, you've got the whole package. Because the Spirit of God um, uh, would direct spiritual worship, and the motivation of all spiritual worship is love of God. Um, when we listen to a lot of folks today that uh, preach what they call the gospel, which the Apostle Paul would take great, great exception to based on his statements in the first chapter of Galatians, where he says, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him who hath called you unto another gospel, which is not the gospel. Paul in that statement is saying, if you've got the wrong explanation about Christ, then you don't have Christ. And I marvel that you are so soon removed from him who hath called you to another gospel. You can't separate the finished work of, of Christ Jesus and the person of Christ. If you have a wrong explanation about the finished work of Christ, then the explanation that you have and which you are presenting to people, people to depict Christ is the wrong explanation, and therefore your depiction is not correct. <clears throat> so, certainly we want to worship um, the Lord in spirit, but we also want to worship Him in truth. Now, that's where the rub comes in very often, is worshiping the Lord in truth. You know, Pilate was so confused about the relativistic uh, presentation that the world has where truth is concerned, that when um, Christ stated to him um, that he was the truth, or he is the truth, um, uh, Pilate's reaction to that was, what is truth? And of course, um, people are struggling with that today. And one of the basic principles uh, of uh, values of the society in which we live today um, is that of um, situational ethics. And um, what situational ethics are based upon um, is transient truth. That is to say, truth that varies. That uh, what is true today is not true um, tomorrow. And uh, folks will tell you that the, the basis for making changes in how we interpret the Constitution of the United States, for instance, is based on uh, the fact that truth is relative, that it is situational. But <clears throat> Scripture teaches me that it is not. Right. That's right. That truth 
um, is objective. He said, let every man be a liar. Um, God is still true. That despite what man's opinion of the matter is, no matter what the matter is, um, uh, that um, despite what opinion man might have about a thing, um, that his opinion is not relevant um, where truth is concerned unless it complies completely with the truth of God. And then it has its relevance in, um, in agreeing with the reality of truth that is objectified in Christ Jesus. In other words, um, Christ Jesus is not only love personified, um, he is not only the, the uh, fullness of the Godhead manifest bodily, um, but Christ Jesus um, is truth personified. And he is the reality. Um, we all um, are um, something less than reality, and if you don't believe that, um, just go to the nearest graveyard and look around and realize that those people were all here one, at one time, and they're not anymore. That um, uh, while our situation may be transient, um, Christ Jesus is not. Amen. I don't know why I got off on all that, but... Um, <clears throat> well, I got off on all that to make this point. That um, there has to be um, some criteria for us to understand. There has to be some basis, an explanation somewhere to be found, instruction someplace, um, in how to worship the Lord so that we can have um, some degree of confidence that we're worshiping in truth. That we're worshiping in truth. Now, if you look at your um, articles of faith, and um, in my um, uh, 50 plus years of reading articles of faith, and in my 30 years of uh, being a minister of the gospel and uh, uh, looking at articles of faith, I can tell you that without exception, I can't recall a single exception, um, every set of articles of faith of the old Baptist contains a statement that um, uh, carries this thought, um, that scripture... Um, is by the inspiration of God, and that it is sufficient uh, for all matters relating to our faith and practice. And by faith we mean the doctrine of beliefs that we have, the doctrines of grace, and also the way we practice our religion, our faith and practice. Now, what that article of faith is addressing is the sufficiency of Scripture to, um, explain, to identify and explain to us what is truth, both from the standpoint of what we believe concerning um, salvation and also how we are to conduct ourselves, both from the standpoint of our daily lives, right. but as we consider the worship of God, how we are to engage in worshiping the Lord. And I want to deal with just one part of that this afternoon for a few moments, and that's the song service. I have a good friend that um, um, is not of our faith. And we I, I met him uh, a year or so ago, and it was one of those things where we just kind of hit it off. He's a, he's a preacher in another faith. Um, we just kind of hit it off, and we've been exchanging emails now for about a year. And when I met him, one of the things that um, drew me to him almost immediately is um, he started complimenting the old Baptist. Now, when I find a preacher of another faith that has nice things to say about the old Baptist, um, I, I have a natural affinity for, toward that fellow. And specifically, um, what he was talking about um, was that the old Baptist have it right where two salvations are concerned. And I thought as I listened to that, wow, this guy is really close. And it's just not going to be any big issue um, to get him to come over to the old Baptist. <laughs> well, I've been working on it a year, and he hasn't yet. <laughs> he had some issues with the communion service, and uh, we visited back and forth on that. They were using grape, ju grape juice in the communion service. And we visited uh, back and forth on that, and I um, showed him 
um, some things about how uh, the fermentation process of wine um, so closely resembles the suffering of Christ at Calvary. Yeah. Yeah. And um, uh, also, from a historical standpoint, the, the, the fact that it was the wrong time of year to even have grape juice in uh, that day and time, and that um, it would have been spoiled or turned to wine, more likely turned to wine, uh, naturally, um, uh, at the time of year that the uh, Lord's Supper took place. And, uh, but he, he um, became convicted of that, and um, I'm thankful to say that he resigned the church that he was serving. And, um, it was not pastoring a church any place because he gave them the opportunity to change from grape juice to wine, and they decided they wanted to keep their grape juice, and he decided they needed someone else to do communion for. So I'm thankful for that. But he wrote me here recently, and he said, you know, Primitive Baptists don't use musical instruments in their worship service. Now, this, this man is an accomplished musician. He is a, just an outstanding uh, bluegrass guitarist. And, of course, he uh, plays the guitar in their worship service. And he has children that are musicians. And uh, they all uh, uh, take part in it. And um, so I, I see that there's more going on here. Um, you, you know, the, the grape juice was somebody, somebody else's um, first love. Uh, whereas now we're dealing with his first love, which is plunking that guitar. Yeah. And, and so, uh, you know, I understand that we've really gotten to the core of the issue where, uh, where he is concerned. And he had asked me to, to write my thoughts on this, and I, I did so and, and sent that off to him. And this afternoon, for a few moments, I'd like to, to um, try to talk with you about why we don't have musical instruments um, in our worship service. The first thing that I want you to understand is that we are a peculiar people, and that's the truth. Um, the Apostle Peter said we were. Now, by peculiar, he didn't mean um, that um, uh, we were odd in the sense of, of um, you know, doing uh, ridiculous things, uh, but rather we're peculiar um, in the sense that, that um, where our identity with God is concerned, as his church, um, that we place value on that that other people don't. <clears throat> and one of the values that we place on it is that um, we strive vigorously to worship the Lord in as close a manner as possible as the apostles did in their day Amen. and as the first century church did. Now I recognize that <clears throat> some things have changed but for the most part, um, what has changed is not things being added to the service, but aids to the service changing over time. Let me give you an example of what I mean. Back in the Apostles' Day, if they held a night service, um, they lit some candles or perhaps some torches um, to light the area where they were meeting. Those candles or torches were an aid to the worship service. They weren't part of the worship service. They aided the, the ability of the folks to have a worship service. Today we have electricity and we have lights. <clears throat> In the Apostle Paul's day, um, he told um, Timothy at one point um, to bring the parchments. And we don't know specifically what he was talking about, but I suspect that it was some of the letters that the Apostle Paul himself had written and could even have been some of the letters that we have um, in the Bible today. In Paul's day, there was no book like this. This book didn't exist in Paul's day. What existed were the parchments. But Paul wanted those parchments to aid him in his studies, to perhaps use to read to congregations that he was preaching to um, as a way of presenting what we today would call a text. He would just say, this is something I wrote. <clears throat> but they were an aid. Recently I was in a service and it set me back and it didn't set right with me at first and I'm, it's still not something that I'm going to um, ever engage in. There are just some things I just don't like. But I was in a primitive Baptist service and a fellow had one of these um, notepad Bibles. <clears throat> and he could get through that thing faster than I could turn pages. And he was using that to preach from. Now, 
At first I looked at that and I thought, well, I, you know, that doesn't seem very old Baptist to me. And I suppose that um, when the Gutenberg Bible was printed and started being distributed, and folks were no longer using handwritten Bibles, that the first time someone showed up at an old Baptist meeting with a Gutenberg instead of an, a, a handwritten Bible, that there was probably somebody there and said, you know, that just doesn't seem like old Baptist to me. <laughs> so I'm not going to uh, make an issue of that. I will tell you as a matter of personal preference, I can't see myself ever using a computer in the, in, in the pulpit. But if someone wants to do it, bless their heart, if they're using the King James Version, um, then, and you know, it's not, uh, not hindering their preaching, then uh, more power to them, I suppose. But there is a difference between an aid to worship and that aid may be changing over time and adding something to the worship service. In other words, um, implementing something um, and making it um, integral or a part of the worship service that didn't start out being part of the worship service. That didn't start out um, as part of um, the apostolic or first century church. This afternoon for a moment, I'd like for us to go over and we're going to start in the fifth chapter of Ephesians. And we're going to look at a, a few scriptures that um, describe to us how um, the, the um, song worship portion of the worship service um, was conducted. Now, when we're talking about sufficiency of Scripture, the Apostle Paul um, told Timothy that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God um, and that, it is, um, uh, that its purpose is for, um, for instruction, for correction, for reproof, um, that, the per that the man of God may be perfect, um, thoroughly furnished. In other words, that the complete explanation of what we need for every good work is provided in Scripture, that it is a thorough um, uh, explanation, and that that explanation is complete. <clears throat> that uh, it being a, a perfect furniture says that you don't have to go someplace else out of Scripture to find something in order to understand what Scripture is saying. And that um, so far that it is thorough um, is that um, uh, everything that we need to know about how to conduct ourselves in the worship service is contained in Scripture. Yep. <clears throat> so that if it's not in Scripture and it's being um, uh, done in the worship service, then um, it's something that's been added to the worship service, rather than something that the Lord Himself implemented. Over in the fifth chapter of the Ephesian letter, the Apostle Paul, we're going we're gonna to back up a little bit here. <clears throat> uh, the Apostle Paul um, says in verse 8, For ye were sometimes... Um, darkness, but now ye are light in the Lord, walk as children of light. Now, <clears throat> um, light and darkness in Scripture, for the most part, um, uh, when it's used in a figurative way, um, light and dark are metaphors for ignorance and understanding, <clears throat> for ignorance and knowledge. And so what he's saying here is um, um, uh, there was a time when you epitomized ignorance. He said, Ye are dark, you were darkness. Not in darkness, but you were the darkness yourself. <clears throat> that, um, uh, that your orientation where God is concerned was one of complete unknowing. That's consistent with what the Apostle Paul says um, in the Roman letter when he says... Um, uh, that man in his, um, in his sin did not want to retain the knowledge of God. That uh, man is willfully ignorant where God is concerned. And Paul is describing here in the Ephesian letter that willful ignorance as being darkness. But he says, now you're in light. And inasmuch as you are in light, you should walk as children of the light that you should um, uh, conduct yourself in a way that is consistent with what you know to be true. Walk as children in the light. Then he goes on a little bit uh, further and he says, in doing this, 
uh, you prove, in verse 10, proving what is acceptable unto the Lord. <clears throat> so he's telling us that walking in the light is acceptable to the Lord in contrast to remaining in darkness or being ignorant of what the Lord would have you uh, uh, to do and to know and understand in your life. <clears throat> so um, from this we understand that it is acceptable to God um, for us to walk in the light or to act upon the knowledge which we have. Now the brothers <clears throat> explained to us this afternoon that <clears throat> there is an element to this knowledge <clears throat> that passeth understanding. And the element of the knowledge that passeth understanding is that in order to know, um, you must hear with spiritual ears. That the natural man receiveth not uh, the things of the Spirit of God, <clears throat> for they are foolishness unto him. And neither indeed um, can he know them, because they are spiritually discer discerned. So when <clears throat> he talks to us here about walking in the light, um, <clears throat> he's... Um, talking to us about doing that from the standpoint of we being people who now are in the light. In other words, we have the ability to understand spiritual things. And one of the spiritual things that is important that we understand and always keep um, in memory <clears throat> is that Scripture is a thorough furnisher. <clears throat> that you don't have to go anyplace else in order to understand um, how God wants you to have a song service. Remember, that's what we're talking about is the song service. That you can go to Scripture, and from Scripture you can learn everything. If you've got a spiritual ear, from Scripture you can learn everything that you need to know about how to have a song service, how to worship the Lord um, in singing. You don't have to go anyplace else. So he tells us here, he goes... In, um, um, uh, forward to this, <clears throat> and he says, but all things that are um, reproved are made manifest by the light, for whatsoever doth make manifest um, 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 as light, wherefore he saith, awaketh thou that sleepeth, arisest from the dead, and Christ shall <clears throat> give thee light. So he's now talking about how it is that we get this, um, get this light. And then he goes on and he says, see then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools. <clears throat> now from that, um, when he talks about walking circumspectly, um, he's talking about um, a, a discreet walk that is based upon knowing something, um, rather than a walk that is based upon foolishness. <clears throat> so if you're ignoring what you know, then you're walking as a fool. But if you're taking into consideration what you know, and you know this because you can spiritually discern, and one of the things you spiritually discern is that the Scripture is a thorough furnisher, and you've gone to Scripture to understand um, how you're supposed to worship the Lord in song, you're walking circumspectly. If you ignore all that and say, well, the folks down the road have a four-piece band, so we want to have a four-piece band, then you're walking as a fool. You're walking at... Do you see that? I, I love the way Scripture puts stuff like this together. It's so easy. <clears throat> he goes on and he says, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. You know what he means by redeeming the time? He means using the time the way God intends you to use the time. Because there are a lot of evil influences out there who will have you waste the time the Lord has given you. You see, <clears throat> the next moment of your life is a moment that God has given you. You know, the older I get, the more, um, the more real that becomes to me. The, the better I understand that, the older I get. <clears throat> that the, 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 the days are short for me. And that I need to redeem the time by using the days that the Lord has given me that I have left, using them in a way that pleases Him. Using them in a way that um, doesn't give um, any audience um, to evil. 
<clears throat> that the days are evil, that there are uh, days of hardship of, before us, that there are days of temptation before us, that there are days um, of um, uh, the wages of sin taking its toll on my body and limiting what I'm going to be able to do, that those days, <clears throat> those evil days are before me, uh, but the fact that there are the, uh, evil days before me um, does not uh, prevent me from redeeming the time by using the time that the Lord has given me to serve Him in a way that He would have me serve Him, including uh, worshiping Him in song the way He would have uh, He would be worshipped in song. He goes on with this, and he says, <clears throat> "Wherefore be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is." Now, he's about to tell us what the will of the Lord is. And he says the wise thing is to understand the will of the Lord. And of course, he's already talked to us about, <clears throat> about doing things or walking in a way that pleases God. So <clears throat> implied in, in uh, this statement about understanding the will of the Lord is to do the will of the Lord. That if you understand the will of the Lord, uh, certainly you will want to do the will of the Lord. You know, that's a struggle this brother's having right now. <clears throat> he, um, he claims that he believes that Scripture is the only rule of faith and practice. And we're going to um, see if he really believes that or not. <clears throat> he goes on, and he says, And be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be ye filled with the Spirit. <clears throat> he says, <clears throat> Don't um, engage in um, carnal stimulants and, and uh, uh, carnal things to, to um, uh, affect your mood or your emotions. But rather, <clears throat> let um, your emotions be um, governed uh, by the Spirit of God. Now, <clears throat> you know how you can tell when people's emotions are governed by the Spirit of God? It's real easy. When someone's emotions are governed by the Spirit of God, they're happy. Because Jesus is coming again. And nothing that happens in this life is going to slow Him down or prevent Him. He's coming again. So when people are filled with the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit isn't anger. The fruit of the Spirit isn't malice. The fruit of the Spirit isn't cynicism. The fruit of the Spirit um, uh, isn't envy. The fruit of the Spirit is, um, is what? It's peace. It's meekness. It's joy. It's faith. Happiness. That's right. <clears throat> you see, if you're filled with the Spirit, the evidence that you're filled with the Spirit is you're going to be happy. You're going to have joy. In your, you know what joy is? <clears throat> joy is the presence of happiness despite all the things that are going wrong. Yeah, man. We're good. You know, um, uh, that's not my definition. Uh, that definition comes from uh, the 12th chapter of the Hebrew letter. Ever looking unto um, Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame. He hated what was going on. He hated that He was being crucified. He despised the shame of Him being crucified, but He endured it. And he didn't, but he didn't endure it with anger. He didn't endure it with bitterness. He didn't endure it with hatred. He endured it with joy. Mm -hmm. Amen. <clears throat> because you were set before him. You were his joy. And he realized that it was worth it. He realized the sacrifice that he was making was worth it. Because um, he was going to have you with him. That's joy. And that joy should be the basis for an optimistic view of life. Because um, our view of life is not limited to the here and now. That we can um, take in stride the here and now in the realization that this life, by every consideration, is inferior 
to the life yeah. that we one day will have with the Lord. And, in, and we can have fellowship with the Lord today and tap into many of the blessings and even some of the experiences that we're going to have in the resurrection. Uh, we can tap into those things right now through fellowship with the Lord. And one of the ways that we can do that is fellowship in singing according to His will. He tells us that. Now, of all the things that he could have talked about here, of uh, doing the acceptable will of God, and uh, doing it with um, uh, in wisdom, um, and understanding what is the Lord of will, the Lord's will, he says, And be ye not drunk with wine where it is in excess, but be ye filled with the Spirit. We don't need uh, the enticements of the world to have joy in our life. We need the Spirit of God to have uh, joy in our life. Speaking to yourselves, listen to this, Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, speak to yourselves singing. He didn't say, speak to yourselves plunking a guitar. <laughs> He didn't say, um, <clears throat> speak to yourselves uh, pounding on a piano um, or uh, turning up an amplifier. He said, speak to yourselves singing. Singing. You know, when <clears throat> Jesus met for the last time with His apostles before He was crucified, um, He instituted the Lord's Supper. And um, in, the, in the tradition of the Passover, under the law service, um, there were several um, psalms, P-S-A-L-M-S, there were several psalms that were sung um, during that Passover dinner. There was about four or five different uh, psalms, some of them quite lengthy, um, that they would sing during that Passover dinner. Now the Passover um, was taken in the home. And it was taken with a sense of anticipation and there was a certain haste that was to be um, um, exercised in the um, eating of the Passover because it was reminiscent of the children of Israel being delivered um, and they were preparing to leave. Yeah. <clears throat> but after the Passover was through, Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper was not a continuation of the Passover. Um, he ended the Passover with that last Passover supper and then supper having ended. He broke bread and he took wine. And after they had broken bread and taken wine and after he had washed their feet, it says that they sang a hymn. Amen. Now, Jesus is God. And anything that is consistent um, with the holiness and righteousness of His character, which involves obedience to the will of the Father while He was here on earth, anything that is consistent with His holiness and His righteousness, Jesus was at liberty to do. He could do anything He wanted within the confines of what He had committed to the Father to do. So when he instituted the Lord's Supper, if there was any place in Scripture where they might have brought a harp in so that then they could have a piano and later a guitar and maybe a bass fiddle, if there was any place to do that, you'd think he would have done it at the Lord's Supper. He could have. He could have played it himself. He could have called, that's right, he could have called on angels and had them play. <laughs> Or he could have played it himself. Or he could have turned to, to Philip and said, Philip, you're now a master virtuoso harp player. <laughs> and sure blink, here's a harp. Um, strum away while we sing this song. But they sang a song, and then they left. They just sang. There are five places <clears throat> in the epistles where um, there is either instruction or description of worship where singing takes place. 
Over in, um, in Acts of the Apostles, you may recall, for instance, in Acts of the Apostles that Paul and Silas were in prison. And at midnight, they were praying. And what else were they doing? They were singing praises. No guitar. No harp. No piano. Organ hadn't been invented yet. They were singing praises. Did you know that God honored that worship service? And he honored that worship. How do we know? He released him from prison. He released him from prison. Now I want to look at um, something else here uh, very quickly. Let's go over to uh, the 14th chapter of, of, um, of uh, 1 Corinthians. And there's a, another element uh, presented here. Remember, <clears throat> we're to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. <clears throat> Worshiping the Lord in spirit <clears throat> is to worship with understanding. The Apostle Paul is making that issue where preaching is concerned, uh, <clears throat> that uh, he would rather speak five words with understanding than uh, 5,000 in an unknown tongue. <clears throat> And he uses to drive that point home the importance of preaching with understanding. <clears throat> and incidentally, um, an unknown tongue can be just saying things that don't make sense. Now, he's talking about people <coughs> preaching in a language that the audience didn't understand. But if you're just saying gobbledygook things that don't make sense, um, that's an unknown tongue. And it doesn't matter um, if you can assign meanings to the sounds that uh, are coming out of your mouth. Um, that doesn't matter. It's still an unknown tongue. But listen to what he says here. <clears throat> he says in verse 14, or verse 13, Wherefore let him that speaketh in an unknown tongue um, <clears throat> pray that he may interpret. In other words, if there's no interpretation, don't do it. For if I pray in an unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. Now here's the problem with an unfruitful understanding. What is it then? I will pray with the Spirit, and I will pray with understanding also. Now he's starting a pattern here, and the logic of the pattern is this, that if you're not praying with understanding, you're not praying in the Spirit. If you're not singing with understanding, you're not singing with the Spirit. Listen to what he says. He says, uh, what is it then? I will pray with the Spirit, and I will pray with understanding also. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will sing with understanding also. Now, <clears throat> by understanding, certainly he means that it would not be appropriate for us to have a song service and sing songs in Latin, because none of us understand Latin, <clears throat> or, or Greek, or whatever that none of us understand that, but there's another element to understanding. Right. To understanding that what we're praying um, is truth, to understand that what we're singing is truth. Amen. Now, I understand that there is a certain amount of liberty that can be taken, poetic license, if you will, uh, where poetry is concerned and where our song service is concerned. But Songs, for instance, when I was a boy, I used to attend the, the um, Stamps Conservatory of Music when I was a boy. I went to their singing schools, and I would go to their singings. And we used to sing songs like, If anyone makes it, surely I will. <laughs> we used to uh, sing songs like, uh, in that, uh, like, um, like um, um, standing outside the portal, uh, standing outside it all. Oh, what a, a fearful feeling, standing outside the call. <laughs> will you get into heaven? Will you be set free? Um, others may get there. Um, you're standing outside. You know what that was? That was a beg for people to uh, come forward and give their lives to Jesus. Now that's not singing with an understanding of the gospel. Amen. Because the gospel don't teach that. Amen. The gospel doesn't teach an attitude, if anyone makes it, surely I will. And the gospel doesn't teach an attitude that uh, the purpose of the gospel is to cast doubt upon your hope of heaven. You know, the Lord never did that. The apostles never did that. Where do people get off doing that today? And it's just as inappropriate for us to sing hymns that express false teachings as it is for a minister to stand in the pulpit and teach false things. Amen, it's just as wrong. 
Well, as we look at this, and uh, the issue, of course, is whether or not it's appropriate to have uh, 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 musical accompaniment of our song service, and people sometimes want to bring up some object objections, and I want to deal with a couple of those objections. You know, you go over to the 150th Psalms, and, and uh, uh, pa the uh, uh, psalmist David there says that we're to praise the Lord um, with the harp. We're to praise the Lord with the timbrel. We're to praise the Lord um, with the cymbal. We're to praise the Lord with dance. You know, some things that were done in the Old Testament are just not appropriate right. in the Lord's church. If we're going to use uh, the Old Testament as a standard for our mode of worship, then we need to put an altar up here uh, where we can slay some lambs. <laughs> because that's what they did in the Old Testament. And Paul tells us that if we're going to uh, be debtors to any part of the law, that we're debtors to the whole law. That if we're going to take any portion of law service, uh, consistency demands that we embrace the whole law. Do you see what an offense that is to the Lord? He was the Lamb of God that took away the sins of God's children. And when someone slays a lamb today as an offering to God, the slaying of that lamb is tantamount to rejecting the blood of Christ. It's offensive to him. It's offensive to him. And if we're going to um, reject the Old Testament law service of animal sacrifice, then it's not the appropriate standard uh, for the form of our worship. The Old Testament um, law service, whether it's ceremony um, or it's um, sacrifice, it's not the standard. The example of the New Testament is the standard. Well, people will go over to the fifth chapter of the book of Revelations, and they'll say, well, over there in the fifth chapter of Revelations, <clears throat> well, let's just go over and read it. They say, over there in the fifth chapter of Revelations, it tells us that <clears throat> there are um, harps in heaven. He says in verse 9 of Revelation chapter 5, and they uh, sung a new song saying, Thou art worthy uh, to take the book and to uh, open the seals. Uh, let me just back up a little bit. He says, And when they had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast uh, redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation and has made um, us unto our um, uh, God kings and priests and we reign and we shall reign on the earth. Well, first of all, would we all agree that the book of Revelations is highly symbolic? Amen. That it's highly symbolic. As a matter of fact, the book of Revelations... The, the genre of the writing of the book of Revelations is apocalyptic genre. And apocalyptic genre, uh, when you translate it into English, what we read may look like metaphors, and it may look like allegories, but it's neither one. It's a whole different method of writing. It's highly symbolic. Let, let, me, let me give you this as an example. <clears throat> if you saw a medicine bottle and it had a skull and crossbones on it, you would know that that's poison. Okay? But those that skull and crossbones does not say poison. Um, it gives you a sense of danger. That it's deadly danger. And you need to be careful with it. That's how apocalyptic genre, it's, a, it's an exaggerated uh, form of metaphor and allegory. It's an exaggerated form. Well, when we read this, first of all, we need to understand that this isn't talking about the church. And that whatever happens in heaven um, is not relevant to the instructions that we have concerning how we're supposed to worship while we're here. But even setting that aside, if we're going to take the harps literally, then literally in heaven... Um, our prayers are sweet-smelling odors of incense. They're not really prayers. <clears throat> that there are beasts in heaven that are worshiping the Lord. You see the problem with all that? Oh, yeah. <clears throat> He's presenting a, a, a picture 
um, in broad symbols here to convey the sense of a thing, not to convey the meaning specifically based upon the things um, as they are presented to us. So this harp is not really about a harp. It's about the quality of praise of the Lord. That, that there will be a quality of praise that is a, as if angels are playing harps when we um, are with the Lord. That, that um, uh, the song that we sing of the worthiness of Christ um, will be um, far more blessed than any song we've ever sung here. That we're going to worship Him more and better in our singing there than we've ever worshipped Him here. That's the point that's being made. Well, there are some other arguments that folks like to bring up about this. One is, well, you know, I, I, I play my piano at home and I play church songs at home. So if I play my piano at home, you know, why is it wrong to play my piano here? Well, the problem with that is that while it's not immoral or unethical for you to play your piano at home, to play Amazing Grace on your piano at home, is not immoral and it's not unethical. It is unethical to do it in church because there's no example you see, it's not immoral or unethical for me to wear a pair of Bermuda shorts at home. It's comfortable. I can, I can turn the, heater, uh, the air conditioner up a little bit and save a few dollars. So it's not immoral or unethical. But look at where the unethics began to creep in. You know, some dear old sisters from the church came over. I put on some long pants. If we were just going out to the church, when I go out to the church and mow the lawns, I don't wear shorts. It's not ethical. I'll bear the heat. There are things that are moral and ethical for you to do in your homes that are just not appropriate for the worship service. Right. It's just not appropriate. <clears throat> Others will say, well, God gave me this talent. So I just want to use the talent that God gave me to His glory. Well, when I was a youngster, I was a high jumper. And I was pretty good at it. And if someone that's a great piano player can use their piano playing in church to God's glory, then I ought to be able to use my high jumping talent to God's glory in the worship service. Or if someone's a really good weightlifter, then you know we ought to bring the weight lifts, the weights in and have weightlifting um, as part of the worship service. See the problem? See the problem? Yeah. <clears throat> Either the Word of God is the only rule of faith and practice, or it's not. If it's the only rule of faith and practice, then our practice needs to be reflected in the Word of God. <clears throat> there are five places where um, singing as worship is presented in the New Testament, and in all five places there are no musical instruments being used. Some folks will look at the word, <clears throat> the uh, Greek word for that, which is um, uh, salo, P-S-A-L-L-O is the way it's um, spelled with the English um, alphabet, and <clears throat> they'll look at the definition of that, and the definition of that means to rub together. And <clears throat> it carries the idea of someone plunking a string of a harp. And they'll say, well, <clears throat> that... Um, obviously uh, means that it's okay to do that. Well, here's the problem with that. If you look at the King James Version of the Bible, uh, where sing is, tra where salo is translated in the New Testament, it's always sing or sang, or sung. And even if you go to some of the modern translations, they still consistently interpret it that way. <clears throat> so, Folks who are experts in understanding the English and in realizing that that word has more than one signification and when it's translated from the Greek into the English, um, pick the signification or the definition of singing as how it's supposed to be in the New Testament. 
if you go to the American Standard um, uh, interpretation of the Bible, and I'm not suggesting you do this, but I've looked it up, if you go to the American Standard or the uh, Revised Standard or even the Darby or, or um, the Schofield um, interpretations, they all interpret it the same way. There's no controversy in the language. That's not a valid argument. But here is the bigger issue. <clears throat> God gave us our voices. And we have some chords that are rubbed. They're vocal chords. And they're rubbed by the air that passes going in both directions. And they produce song. And your voice is a voice that God gave you. Amen. He didn't make that piano. He didn't make the guitar. But He made your voice. And I believe, and this is, I'm just speculating now, I believe that He wants to hear the kind of praise down here that He's going to hear up there. He wants to hear us praise Him down here with the things that He made in us. Because that's what we're going to praise Him with when we get to heaven. <clears throat> the fact of the matter is that musical instruments did not begin to be used in religious um, Christian religious service until, around, until um, as late as the late 600s, the 7th century. And it was introduced um, along about that time. That for <clears throat> more than 600 years, the church, um, the primitive church, um, sang a cappella when they worshipped the Lord. And then some things were added. It makes just as much sense to add a piano or a brass band, or a full orchestra to the song service as it would to putting jelly on communion bread. Mm -hmm. yes. It's an addition. It's not there in Scripture. And then there is one last thing I'd like for you to consider. The last 300 years of religious freedom that the church has experienced is an anomaly. It's the exception to the rule. Yeah. The previous 1,700 years have been 17 centuries of persecution at the hands of others. <clears throat> there was a law, for instance, in England that a nonconformist church, of which we Baptists were at the time, could not be located within five miles of an English township or even um, a little village, that they couldn't be within five miles. The thought being that it would be so difficult for people to get to them that they would die out. You know what the old Baptists did? They went into caves. They went into the tops of mountains. They hid in the cleft of the rock and they sang their hymns and they prayed and they preached the gospel. Friends, there's no guarantee that we won't be placed in a similar circumstance sometime in the future. Aren't you thankful that we don't have to rely on a piano to lead our singing or an orchestra um, to entertain us in our worship service if we're ever placed in that situation again? That we can go back into the mountains, we can go back into the caves, and we can sing praises to God the way we've always sung praises to Him. God bless you. Of Sovereign Grace, a ministry of Paradise Primitive Baptist Church in Arlington, Texas. Paradise Primitive Baptist Church is located at 5300 Mansfield Road in Arlington, Texas. Services begin at 1030 each Sunday morning. Plan to come and worship with us. To find out more about Paradise Primitive Baptist Church, visit www.paradisepbc.org. Be sure to visit our website for articles, video, and audio sermons, as well as biblical answers to your questions. Thanks for watching, and be sure to join us again next week. May God richly bless you.